I will not speak about science. I will speak about space, but not space uh, in abstraction, but what is uh, an instrument and how we go to space and what we will do in space. From the drawing to the paper, de la feuille au papier, it's a word in French, and I begin with something which is not astrobiology, but uh, which is very important. And this is a drawing which was made in 1993, uh, describing what would be uh, the best mission to uh, study the cosmic microwave background, the CMB, with Jean-Marie Lamar. He, is an he was an engineer and a scientist, let's say, at the Inst Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris, uh, um, yes, Institut d'Astrophysique Spatiale, in Orsay. And he made this drawing and this calculation. And uh, 16 years after, this was a project, you see. And it was really something which was a major uh, breakthrough, the knowledge that we have from the CMB, and still publishing, you see, uh, two years ago, the Planck results. And a lot of people, and is uh, somewhere here, Lamar, here. <laughs> the name is here. It was really at the origin of things. And now you have this well-known view of uh, what's a CMB, I think like that. But to go from this point to that point is not as easy as it looks like. <laughs> That's a lot, a lot of questions. So first, we have to make some, and we have to have some definition. But before definition, what you need to have a space mission? You need to have an ID. And this is very important. You don't do some things because it's, it's nice, something like that. You do something because you have a very, very strong ID. Then you have a need. Space is the only way, the only means to solve the ID and the problems that you are raising. And then you have a goal. The goal that means that you have to make a measurement. You must have something which is deliverable. Not something just, ID is nice, but you have to put that, I would say, in uh, frequencies, in numbers, in something which is real. And this is the basic thing that you have to have to make, I would say, a space mission. If you don't have that, you will not go anywhere. It's not true only for space. It's kind of rule for life, huh? anyway. <laughs> but in space, that's mandatory. Because you are with people like me in an agency, if you don't have that, it's not interesting for us. It has no sense. But an ID, a need, a goal. And then we can discuss to build something relevant. Then, in space, we have a lot of different things. We have programs, projects, and instruments. A program is a big ID. For instance, the space station, there was no need. There was no scientific need. There was a political need. And we made, we, not me, but we say the, the science community in uh, Western world with Russia made this program because there was a political need. Just as explaining, because I see some people, because at the end of the Soviet Union, people were not paid. At that time, the engineers were solicited by countries, United States, France, Germany, North Korea, India, China, to go there and to help them to, this, to, um, to make, for some more science, for others, some ballistic missiles. Then it was decided that we have to keep these people in their own country. And the best way to have those people in their own country is to pay them in their own country. And then there was a lot of money which was spent by the United States and Europe to keep, I would say, all the people from the space business in Russia. And then we decided to make that. And the uh, and, uh, United States ordered the first two modules of the space station, Zarya and Zvezda, which were built there. And then 
they decided in the USA to have 10 flights of the shuttle to the Mir space station. And this was a way to give money and to have people staying in their own country. This is why we have the International Space Station flying now. Science is using it, but the science is not the goal. The goal was to keep the people in their own country. So this is a program. You have big programs. Now you have a program about the, around the moon. You have a program of a space station in China. You have some program in uh, Russia also uh, to uh, go on the moon and so on and so It's, I would say, something which has on a long time and with several missions and several projects uh, all together. Now we have, for, for instance, a program to retrieve uh, samples from Mars, which is a discussion between uh, uh, NASA and ESA. And so this is a big thing that you have, I would say, a long term and mainly the driver is political. But policy is really the driver, so the driving force of this kind of program. We want to do something, we want to do something big, we want to do something together. We want, for instance, for the launcher, we have the Ariane program, Ariane 6 program, because we want to have in Europe, I would say, an independent access to space. So that's really a program. Then, in the program, we have what we call project. So this is one project, this is Ariel. This is uh, the next, uh, the, the next uh, uh, observatory which will be used to uh, look at the atmosphere of the exoplanets. The hot Jupiter, not the, <laughs> not the small one, but the hot Jupiter. It was just adopted um, one year ago by ESA. I'm working on it with the people. I'm working, I'm helping as a program scientist to have these uh, things done. And this is a project. In that project, you have the scientific payload, which will be delivered by the scientific consortium. And we'll come back, come back to that later. And you have the bus, I would say the satellite itself with the function, will be, which will be produced directly by uh, the industry. In this case, it will be uh, OHB in uh, Germany. And uh, they will produce that. And between the scientific payload and the bus, there is an interface. And the most difficult is to manage these interfaces. Because they are not in the same logic. And we will see that at the end. But, and it's not so easy to have, I would say, this payload, which is very complex. You have a telescope, you have a, uh, the detectors, you have the spectrometers, uh, you have the things to, um, uh, to, to, to cool everything here, and everything is complicated. And this has to be delivered by a consortium of scientists, which is the worst thing that you can have. Because they don't have, I would say, the mind done to produce and to deliver something which is hardware. And this is why Behind that, there are the space agencies. Because the space agencies are here and there to help the scientists to make what they dream of a reality in time, in the budget, which is <laughs> quite important too. And uh, for instance, this payload is led uh, by uh, Eike Hauer in uh, Germany with a very, very strong support of uh, the DLR. In this payload, there are around uh, 15 countries with 15 different partners delivering uh, parts of this and part of that, even outside of Europe, because part of that will be delivered by uh, NASA. And in this payload, there will be, for instance, the spectrometer, which will be done in France, and there's uh, the hospice of uh, IAP, Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris, and with the help of the CEA, the Centre d'Energie Atomique. And uh, so, all these interfaces have to be uh, bound together. And because this will be uh, uh, financed by the CNES, CNES is for ISA and for the, uh, the PI, the responsible of the consortium, is the leading, the French leading funding agency. 
So you see that it's a kind of matryoshka, and I will take this example very often, that uh, you have, I would say, the, the project, then in the project you have different pieces, and in the, each pieces you have, I would say, some responsibilities with interfaces. And any time you have interfaces, you have problems. <laughs> That's the beginning. So then we have the instruments. This is an instrument which will fly on ExoMars, is Wisdom. The PI ship is in Latmos in, uh, in France. And you have the electronic box, which is made in France. And this is the antenna, which are uh, produced in Germany. Always is a consortium also for the small instrument. So this is uh, the flight model, in fact, which is delivered and uh, which will be uh, integrated in the rover, I would say, next September, I think, for launch in 2020. So this is an example of an instrument. And in this, in this instrument consortium, you have, I would say, the same organization in general, with a uh, project lead, uh, with a PI, and with co investigator and so on and so on. So, and it's very important because everything is going here. And so it's delivered. So when we are speaking about a mission or about an instrument, we have some phases. And I just, you, if you go sometimes in space business, you will have this kind of thing. The phase zero is a preliminary concept. Here's a drawing that I show you, which is why quite, evaluated, quite evolved already. Sometimes it's just a drawing on the, on the table, you know, at the restaurant. <laughs> That's the beginning. It's just general. We will go uh, through these different phases, and this is a complete phases, and some are divided. And you have, for instance, B1 and B2, which is very uh, common. Uh, B1 is uh, still paper, and B2 is you, begin, you are beginning to work really on the, the real things. For the E, you have also E1, E2, and E, N. E1 is uh, from uh, the beginning of the launch, camp of the launch camp campaign up to the receipt involved in flight. So, but let's say that this is important. And if you go in a, a lot of, uh, in space business is always the case. And sometimes you have that also in the industry. So this kind of phases to develop, uh, I don't know, a, a car or anything like that. This is also uh, useful for life. So just some principle. So phase zero is initial, initial proposal. So you, you have to be audacious. You don't have any limit. You must be, you, you have to invent everything. You have, okay, I want to do that. I need, I want to go to the moon. I want to fly up to Proxima du Centre. I want to do anything you want, but you have to, it's really the phase zero. Then, no limit. At this stage, no limit. The limits will come anyway. But at the beginning, just go and be audacious. All scenery and proposal are discussed and confronted. But you are elaborating, I would say. Then you are working on the idea itself. Then, at one point or another, you are defining a raw financial envelope. It will be 10 billion. 100 billion, 1,000 billion, it's not exactly the same. But it's a raw order of, very a raw of the order of magnitude, rough order of magnitude. Then you are switching for the phase A. So among all the scenarios that you invented, you are working on two or three different phases. And you begin a detailed study, and then you are putting some numbers. That's terrible. <laughs> then you have been uh, audacious. Now you have to be inventive <laughs> to have, I would say, to have the numbers fitting with your ideas <laughs> at point point or another. And so detailed study, technical description of what we have to do is a functional analysis, let's say. And you have to identify what are the potential difficulties. Traveling at the speed of light. It's difficult if you are not light. <laughs> then you have some difficulties. For instance, if you want to go to a Proxima du Center. And you have beginning the detailed definition of the mission and its possible cost. And yeah, you are not on the order of magnitude. Now you are 
stretching, I would say, in a real financial envelope. And you have to make a demonstration based on paper of the scientific relevance of the mission. So, and uh, you have to be inventive, yes, but you have also to be convincing to go further. You have to convince people that you are able to do it. That on a financial envelope, on a reasonable financial envelope, without extreme difficult uh, technical difficulties. And this is very fundamental at this stage. Then you are switching to phase B. Phase B, I would say, is just the stage of Ariel right now. It's the end of Plateau. Plateau will uh, go in phase CD in the next few months. Phase B, you have selecting one now. A very, very detailed study with a technical description of each task, each task with a schedule. And the schedule is uh, very important. I remember something, the first time I came, I, I worked in, uh, in the space business, I was on a project, which was a resource project. It was a project between the US and France in the uh, 80s. And it was not as modern as we have, and I received, we received, I would say, a wonderful schedule, 18 meters long, <laughs> 18 meters, with each task. And there was just a teleconference. And the head of project told, we are six months behind schedule. <laughs> it's not admissible. <laughs> so, so schedule is <laughs> very important. It was a phase, uh, phase B, in fact. <laughs> 18 meters long, and it was, <laughs> believe me. It was incredible. <laughs> a lot of fun, anyway. So you are going in the detailed definition of the mission and the cost, and you are doing that. Take margins. When I was on the side of the project, I was always thinking, oh, this margin, oh, we will do that in uh, two kilograms, uh, plus or minus uh, 20 grams. Okay, no. Now I am a kind of manager. At this stage, at least 30% margin on anything, on the money, on the weight, on the energy, any, the, any time, okay. you need the margins and take margins. Even you are the scientist, even you are thinking that you manage that perfectly, take margins. And in some times, and now we are a little bit uh, discussing the level of margins, but the, at this stage, the minimum is 30%, in something is 50%. Because we know that there is a difficulty on that, uh, on this detector, on this kind of uh, connector, of this, and so and so and so. On uh, the software, our software is very easy. It's just it's easy. No, no. You are taking margin on the time because it's not easy at all, and you know that there are a lot of difficulties. And more you have interfaces, more you need margins, because at one point everything has to come at the same time at the same point, and sometimes something is late, and then you are take, you are I would say uh, burning your margins on the schedule. We'll go then that. So phase B is very important, but take margins. You will protest if you are a scientist. You will uh, protest against the management because they will tell you you need 30% margin, you need 50% margin on that, and that, and so and so. And no, I know how I do that, and so and so. Believe me, take margins. <laughs> phase C. Then you are beginning to do the real work. Now the mission is adopted. Uh, for instance, at ESA, the first mission is selected, is uh, at the end of the phase A. Phase A. People are working uh, during the phase B. At the end of the phase B, the mission is adopted. That means that you are putting all the money on the table to go up to the end. And then you are doing, I would say, very, very important thing for phase C, which is very linked with the phase D. Phase C is really, I would say, you are building the parts in different countries and uh, things like that. You are working on the interfaces, you are checking everything, you are producing some models, like for the, the structural and thermal models, for instance, just to check if it's uh, working well. Then you are preparing a qualification model 
of the instrument, of the payload, or something that you want to do, and so on and so on, to be tested and to verify that everything is working in the condition in which they will be used. So, you have to make some choice. Uh, you have to adjust the, the cost at the calendar, the schedule. Because, for instance, if you want to launch to Mars, you have some, uh, some windows. You cannot allow uh, one month delay could cost 200 million dollars. It happened. Cease. It happened because the, the instrument was not ready. So the launch is postponed. The rocket was on the launch pad, and they stayed not at the launch pad, at, at the launch site for two years. It has a cost. It's not a thing. Huh? So, you have to be uh, very, very, very serious on the calendar and the schedule. And be cautious, keep margins. <laughs> Don't hit your margin just at this stage. <laughs> Take them. Oh, we have time. Oh, no, no. We, we, yes, we have two kilograms. We will take well, 50 grams, 500 grams more for electronics or to consolidate that and that and so on. Keep your margins. You will need it. At the end, you will need them. So, phase D. Now you are building the qualifications, the flight, and the spare models for the instruments. So it's not for the bus. But you, you, for the satellite itself, you are just building one. But for the instruments, you are building a lot of models. In general, you have the first model is what we call the STM, structural and thermal model. Just a piece of metal. Uh, with some uh, resistor, resistors in that, inside to have the heat and to, to see how you produce uh, the heat when you are working. And you have the mass and, if possible, the center of gravity. And then you, with that, you can assemble that and to make a lot of tests. Then, in general, you have the qualification model. Qualification model is a model which is almost like the flight model but that you can uh, put on vibration, uh, shock, and things like that, and just to test it. And to test if it's able to resist the launch, to resist the landing, to resist any kind of things you can find. And just to an example, when you are doing an instrument, for instance, for ExoMars, you are doing a wonderful instrument that you are building and assembling in a clean room, ultra clean room. Then you put that on, in the sand, on the beach, you take a, a gun, it has to work. This is the kind of test that we are doing on this kind of instrument. Because with the landing on Mars, there will be a lot of dust and so on and so And uh, the, uh, uh, you have a lot of pillows uh, during, the, during the cruise and even for the deployment of the, of the rover. And each pillow is a chuck. A very, very strong chuck. And because everything is metallic, there is no uh, dumping. <laughs> it's just like... <laughs> so, when you are building this instrument and the qualification model, but so the flight model is a kind of jewel that nobody can uh, <laughs> touch, and it's just uh, put inside, and you have always a spare model in case if you have a problem at the last stage of the integration. You need a spare because you don't have to go back uh, in detail. So, generally, then there is a lot of discussion between the science and the engineers, and with the degradation of the performances because it's too costly, it takes too much time, and so and so. so. Mass margin and power allocation are not sufficient. This is. <laughs> <laughs> the place where you are really fighting for the margins. Just an example, when we began ExoMars in 2003, the program ExoMars from the European Space Agency to send a rover on Mars with instruments. At the beginning, in 2003, it was, dear scientists, just tell us, for Isa, tell us what you want, and we will do it. Okay? Then, 
23 instruments. I would say uh, on a rover uh, 100 kilograms. There was a plan for to have, I would say, 50 kilograms of payload. So great, impossible, obviously. So there was a discussions in 2005. There was just a small sentence that the instruments will be uh, done and paid by the national space agencies. It's no longer ESA who was paying and uh, managing the instrument, it was the National Space Agencies. So then we have all the demands from the scientists coming in. And because at the beginning, ESA was telling, just tell us what we want. And they just planned to have, I would say, the, the detector. The instrument for the scientists was the detector. Then the industry came and said, OK, no, now you have also and the instrument where Weighting, I would say, 200 grams, 100 grams, half a kilo, 800 grams, what? Very, very big instrument, just a detector. Then it came, oh, you have to plan to have the, the, the power, the power, the, the power. And the power is, I would say, half of the, the weight of the instrument. Oh, you will have also to use this kind of uh, connector and this will wait, I would say, for each, se each uh, single instrument, it will be uh, 200 or 300 more grams. And so on, and so on, and so on. So from the beginning, it was just an idea and the data is the data. So now we have to provide instruments <coughs> like Wisdom. And for instance, at the beginning, Wisdom was planned for uh, perhaps 300 grams. It was two boards and the antennas. Now you have the power supply, now you have the, <laughs> the box, now you have the wiring, now you have and things like that, and it's around 200, uh, two, two kilograms, uh, 200, two kilograms and 500 grams, 2.5 kilograms. So it's not the same. So a lot of discussion there. And then if the weight is increasing, the budget is increasing also. And now you have a fight between what is costly, is it needed, is it nice to have, and you have to make some choices. And then the management is enter in the game. And you have technical difficulties. Sometimes it's impossible. Because for instance, you need a wire, you have, you have planned for a wiring for, uh, let's say, uh, 50 centimeters. But going into the, inside the rover, you need to have uh, a routing which is different. We have to, bo to have uh, some uh, uh, the book, I don't know, the buckles like that for the wiring just to avoid because uh, I don't know how to call that a spiral. You know, you have uh, some, uh, some loops, well, so you have uh, loops and so on and so and your 50 centimeters are becoming three meters. Then the signal is not the same. The transmission is just the same. The, the heat dissipation is not the same, and so on and so on. And then you have to go back to the drawing board and to begin to make new calculation, to increase, I would say, the power at the beginning, and so on and so on. And any time you have this kind of thing, it's very, very time consuming, and you are eating your margins. But it happens. Believe me, it happens. <laughs> so, and interactions between scientists, engineers, and technologists are more and more Difficult. That's the real world. In general, the agency is, is there to make things, to smooth everything as much as possible. It's not always possible, but at the end, it's always more money and more time. And now, then you are eating your margins. So be strong and rigorous because very often, I would say, the first victim of this kind of battle are the qualification and the calibration of the instrument. It's always the last thing that you have to do. <laughs> and, is, uh, and then they are compressing the time, compressing the time, and they, we don't have time to calibrate the instrument. But if you are launching something which is not calibrated, it's useless. If it's not qualified and test, it's useless. So, and the scientist has to be strong and rigorous and to ask and to make that this qualification and calibration has to be done. It's very important. This is a view of what is going on right now for the Mars 2020 launch of the project of Mars 2020 by NASA. 
In this case, it's remarkable because everything is done at the same place, at GPL. Every single thing. Here you have uh, the cruise bus, the, satellite, the, uh, the spacecraft which will propulse everything to Mars. Here you have the descent stage, which is under construction. These are the flight models. Here you have, I would say, the back shell, which is on the back of that uh, to enter the Mars atmosphere. And here you have the front shell, the thing which is burning, you know, when you are entering the atmosphere. And here you have the rover. And everything with the, is, is a kind of this descent stage. So, everything at the same place. For ExoMars, which is an example, to be, which is supposed to be launched also in 2020. The back shell is done in Italy, uh, in, uh, in Russia, the heat shield also. The cruise is done in Germany. Uh, the descent platform is done in Russia. The rover is done in uh, Germany, in um, UK. Everything is managed by Italy. And the instruments are coming from different places. Interface are it's quite challenging. And that's something, a big difference with uh, what is going on with Mars 2020 and ExoMars, which is supposed to be launched as the same year. So, just an example of a kind of, you see, a, a integrated approach. This is a Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Los Angeles. And the European approach, with, where everything is spread around in Europe, which is just adding some small difficulties. Nothing is smooth. This is the flight model one of SuperCam, of the mass unit of SuperCam. SuperCam is an instrument which, is suppo which will go on Mars 2020 rover and which is made of two parts, the mass unit which is made in France and the body unit with a spectrometer, let's say, which is made at uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory in the United States. So uh, this is, uh, uh, this is uh, in fact, a combination of five instruments. The first one is a LIPS, a letter, which is there to, uh, to do, I would say, to know the uh, elemental composition of, uh, of the target. You, you are shooting with a laser. And you are a UV spectrometer, which is just, I would say, recomposing the, the light and then finding the spectrometer, the, the spectrograph of that. Then you have an infrared spectrometer. Then you have a Raman in the same thing. Then you have a camera, a color camera. And then you have a microphone. All together here. And this is, I would say, the optical unit the optical uh, box of the of SuperCam, and there is uh, an electrical box. So this was, I would say, the 1st of December of this year. It was supposed to be delivered on the 10th of January. Unfortunately, it was put in, a, in an oven and the oven was supposed to be uh, stable at uh, 60 degrees and it went up to 300 degrees. A small problem. A small problem. Dead. This is dead. I can tell you that there was a lot of discussion. <laughs> so we have to find a scapegoat. It's easy to find a scapegoat. But it was not a problem of scapegoat. It was a conjunction of a lot of problems. First, there was um, a lack of rigor in the way people were working. The quality uh, control and things like that. Then there was, I would say, a failure in the oven itself, because it was supposed to stay at 40 degrees and it went up to 300 degrees. But behind that, there was a management problem. 
Because people working on that, they were working also on ExoMars, and I am responsible at CNES for the both, for this one and for the Raman on ExoMars. And uh, two months before, I warned the management, the director, and the technical director of the of the uh, of the laboratory that there is a problem. People are overloaded. They are almost in burnout because they were working since uh, two years now. I would say uh, six days a week and uh, without extra pay. They are uh, under pressure, permanent pressure, with uh, order in different direction and things like that. And they need a rest and they need to have more people. So they say, oh yes, we will have a half an uh, FTP here, full-time uh, FT, uh, full-time employee, half one here, uh, a third one here, uh, one third of, so now, after this, now they have 20 people more <laughs> there to work. There was a management problem, and the management problem was visible because there was small problems which are arising either in uh, ExoMars, small things, uh, a test which was not very well done. There was, they, they just uh, forget something, just, just not so important, small things. But I would say small signals were coming in. And I'm, I was trying to warn the people, but we don't have the money to pay 20 more people before the catastrophe. But it happens. So, and now, so this is, I would say, the planning of all the, the mission. They have to deliver at the last date, and NASA and GPL were very, very helpful. Because if you are not delivering, they will not launch. If they are not launching, that means that they have to wait for two more years. $200 million. Minimum. Minimum. So it's not nothing. It's not uh, just a joke. Huh? So we were working all together. We were supposed to deliver at this time, you see, uh, around the 10th of January. And from here, FM2, uh, yes. Uh, uh, okay, we are building now the mass unit flight model number two. From here to there, we have to make that, I would say, in, uh, let's say, seven months. And this is, sorry, this is an absolute limit. If we don't reach this limit, then we have to postpone the rough flight. We have to do in seven months what we did in two years. Respecting the planetary protection rules, respecting all the quality, doing all the tests which are compact here, the TVAC, the thermal and vacuum uh, test, and so on, so on, so on. Everything is correct. And hopefully everything will go smoothly. You are supposed not to have any failure anywhere. Not on the instrument itself, either on the instrument that you are using to set up everything and to test everything and so on. So, on. so and you have, I would say now you have uh, around 80 people working on that in Toulouse. And the main problem is still the management. Because you have to manage the people because they are upset now, they are working in two shifts. That means that uh, they are beginning at 6 o'clock up to uh, 2 o'clock and then from uh, noon up to uh, 8 o'clock. And they are working on Sunday if necessary, on Saturday if necessary, on Sunday if mandatory. Okay? But it's not so simple because, for instance, we sometimes you need to have, I would say, for, the, for instance, for the vibration test, you have to go in a company. The company is not open on Sunday. They say, oh, no, we are closed. We want to open the Sunday. Okay, now you need uh, two people uh, there or three people, and you have to pay, uh, we say, uh, 20 more thousand euros. 20 more thousand euros, yes. So it's a very complex situation, but that's real world, <laughs> you know? And it was stupid. It was not stupid. It was really the, the, the result of overpressure, overload on the people. And this is the management. And the responsible is the manager. Because if you are a manager, you are supposed to manage and to be responsible too. So anyway, this is an example. 
Another example, that's just speaking about reality, is ExoMars with ESA. We are deeply involved in ExoMars and I have a chance, the chance I would say, to work on ExoMars since 2003, uh, at the beginning, with people. So, and uh, it's ExoMars is a, a joint mission between ESA and Roscosmos, Europe and Russia. Russia is providing the launcher, uh, two launchers, one for the TGO, which is uh, European and which is working well, is uh, on uh, around Mars. Yesterday I was in a meeting in Paris with all the scientists and they have, uh, I would say, outstanding results and they will present, uh, they are preparing paper for science and for nature. So everything is going well. Well, ExoMars is working well. Now we have to suppose to deliver a platform and a rover. This is Mars 2020 and it's not as easy as it seems. And uh, at the highest level of uh, Roscosmos and, uh, and, uh, and ISA, you say ISA DG, Director General, and Roscosmos DG, they have, I would say, a monitoring every month. There is a meeting at the level under every week, and there are almost a teleconference twice a day. So, it's not easy. And this is a kind of uh, overall schedule that we have for ExoMars. So this is the launch. You see, is uh, roughly uh, 20 days next year. This is a window. If you miss that, you have to wait for two more years. <laughs> okay? And you are not sure to reach the same place. But anyway. And so you have, I would say, you see the different modules which are done in different places. Astrium UK for the rover, OHB for the carrier module, Lavoshkin and Lavoshkin in Russia uh, for uh, the, um, the spacecraft composite and from the landing platform, Italy TAS uh, for, uh, for, the, for the overall uh, architecture, and, the, and some, uh, a lot of tests, the spacecraft composite and the descent module uh, test, and the avionic test be bench, and the software for the landing. Everything is red, is where we have difficulties. The goal is to have, you have to listen, the goal was to have 60 days of contingency, the margin of 60 days, of contingency, I would say uh, by December, by December 20, uh, 19, uh, 2019. At the end of this year, we must have 60 days of margin. That means that in the development, we have 16, uh, 66 days, but not 16, 66 days free. Now we have 60 days, but it's not 60 working days, because we have 60 days with at the beginning, it was 66 days, full day. That means that five days a week, one shift, eight hours. Now we have 66 days with triple shift. So people are working uh, uh, three times eight hours. No, not the same. Huh? So that means that that means instead of 66, you have 22 actual days. Then they are working on Saturday and Sunday. Instead of five, you have seven. So you don't have 22 days. But you have in real days, you have around 15 days. Two full weeks. That means that if you have any technical problem, you are dead. Because you can add people, but at one point or another, Things have to be done one after the other. As I'm telling uh, often, I uh, would say, nine uh, women are not doing a baby in one month. At one point or another, <laughs> they have to be successive <laughs> things. You cannot compress everything. And uh, so, I can tell you that we have we have a lot of uh, discussion about that. And the problem is, just to tell the truth, and you will have everything, it's 
the real discussion that we have, the actual discussion that we have now. So, if you are missing this opportunity, we will launch in two years. So, 200 more millions, okay, it's quite a lot of money. But, but, we are preparing the most simple return. And the most simple return is joint venture between NASA and ESA. The goal is to have the samples coming back in 31, in, two, uh, in 2031. Okay? To have that, to reach this goal, we have to launch in 2026. That means that you have to decide in 2020 to go or not to go to prepare the fetch rovers, the satellites, and things like that. If in Europe we are spending 200 million euros to launch ExoMars because ExoMars is late, we cannot commit for 400 more hundred euros for the mass sample return. So, you see, it's not simple. So, what we will do? What is better, to go for the mass sample return and then to stop ExoMars or to do ExoMars and to get out from mass sample return? That's a question which is asked now and we are trying to solve. We have to be inventive, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> okay, so nothing is innocent. And this is the real world. It's not something that I'm inventing. And frankly speaking, we are working on that now. So space is not very, is not uh, straightforward. It takes time and it's some difficulties. So anyway, uh, in Russia, they have the this is, the, I think, the qualification of the landing platform because they are not in the right uh, gown to be on the flight spot platform. But it's, uh, no, it's just the, the structure. There's no instrument, nothing is done. This was taken, I would say, one month ago, and they have to deliver that in one month in Cannes. And they have to equip that and to test it. I have some doubts. Anyway. So, we have the rover, this is the rover of uh, ExoMars, this is the STM, the structural and thermal model of uh, ExoMars. It was in Toulouse for test six months ago. We are supposed to deliver the flight model equipped with all the instruments in December of 19, this year. We are not in advance either in France. It's very nice, you see, it's, it looks like a real thing. It's real, it's, it's real. So a lot of uh, things and uh, so, but it's just, it's just metal. Nothing intelligent inside. So, phase E, <sighs> one happy moment. So this is a very old thing. I was working on the EBS. Uh, it was, uh, yes, more than 10 years ago. And the samples were on the top of the rockets, ready to go five hours after. Launch failure at the launch, on the launch pad itself, I would say, 20 seconds after the launch, the, the ignition. So, happy moment, but a lot of deception. It happens. <laughs> Space is not... Um, a smooth way, it happens, believe me. Even uh, Soyuz uh, is one of the most reliable launchers. It's more than, it's around 2,000 launchers with uh, less than 2% failure. This was one of the 2% failure. Anyway, so we have to take care of the people because it, were, it was very difficult for them because they worked for 10 years to prepare the, the samples to prepare the, the experiment. And then, uh, uh, what we can do? But it's, it's nothing, <laughs> it's, it's, it's gone, <laughs> that's it. So, difficult. Well, sometimes it's working, and for instance, we hope that it will work. This is, I would say, Keops, we are speaking about uh, exoplanet, and Keops will be one to characterize the diameter. I don't know if he can do a trappist or not, 
I think that Trappist would, could be uh, in the target. <laughs> I think so, anyway, by uh, measuring the, the diameter of the, uh, of the exoplanet by, uh, by the, for the transiting exoplanet. So, it, sorry. So it will be launched if between the 15th of October and the 15th of uh, November of this year. So you heard about. This is a small mission from ESA. And uh, because I am responsible also of uh, exoplanets at CNES, so I'm involved in that. I'm involved just to, to manage you know, the things that. Uh. But uh, so this was in uh, not it was uh, not in Toulouse, but we saw him in Toulouse, and it's ready to launch to be launched. And now he's waiting. Not is is waiting uh, that the the main passenger of the launch will be ready. And uh, now it's almost ready. Uh, the main passenger is uh, an Italian satellite. So, Kyops is ready to go, and we will begin the phase E. So, in fact, the phase E is not beginning at the uh, is beginning at the at the beginning of the launch campaign, which is roughly uh, three months before the launch, and uh, finish when uh, you have uh, all the results, and uh, you have to take care of the data, and you have to keep the things alive. For instance. Uh, if you take uh, Cassini, it lasts for uh, f 15 years almost. Uh, if you take Sorso, it's, uh, it's lasting for uh, 25 years. Uh, Pioneer is still uh, going on and things like that. So you, sometimes it's very long, it's, uh, but for instance, uh, and I will take the example uh, later, Mars Express was launched in 2003, and Mars Express is still working. And it's a problem because we still have, it's, it, co it costs to have these people uh, taking care uh, of the data, not of the data, but uh, of the spacecraft itself, giving orders to the spacecraft, retrieving uh, the signals, and so on. It's, it's around 10 million, 10, 10 million euros a year, something like that, for ESA, but for, for Europe in general, and then for, uh, for an agency, is around uh, perhaps uh, 1 million euro a year to keep the, the scientific, uh, the science community working and things like that. So, it's not nothing. And uh, so, Voyager, Hubble is still working, and you see Hubble is uh, 20 years now. Uh, the shuttle was doing that. The Mir space station was lasting for uh, 15, 15 years, 16 years, and things like that. So, phase E is, is nice, but sometimes you have some problems and catastrophe. So, nothing is certain as long as the data or the samples are not in the proper laboratory, duplicated if possible, in safe conditions and permanently monitored. Believe me, people are losing data. <laughs> people are losing samples. And it's very important, and for instance, it's very difficult to put, uh, for instance, a PhD on a mission, on the data of a mission which is not launched. I have an example. There was, I don't know what time is it? It was on the, on the International Space Station, on the, on the shuttle. We had an experiment on the brain of rats, of rodents. And uh, we had um, a PhD student who was trained to make the proper dissection and the proper measurement and so on. So it was quite delicate, I would say. And the launch was planned for the next year. Well, so, and he was, so one year training, one year at the launch, one year to write the thesis three years, well, so the launch was postponed for one year. Ah, then he made uh, this work on the ground with some simulation, but he has the knowledge, the know-how. So I've just after the thesis, we will keep it, we'll keep him, I would say, one extra year as, uh, I would say, a uh, temporary employee. Okay. Yes, it's very important, we will do it. Then the launch was postponed for six months. Then for after six months. Then once again for six months. 
And the guy was always there. The PIR retired. First changed the lab, come from Montpellier to Paris, then retired. And then the poor guy was alone in the lab, knowing nobody's and doing something which was not really related to the lab. The launch occurred, and this was, I would say, the second accident of the shuttle. So, people died coming back, you know, uh, when they came back in 2002. And then he has nothing to do. Finished. So, then we decided at Nest to to uh, keep him to to keep him paid for one more year to to help him to find a new job. <laughs> but it, 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 I would say he spent six years, not for nothing because the first three years for the thesis, but the next three years for nothing. So you can expect something. But as soon as he's not back in your lab, you cannot be sure of anything. And this is a very big problem in space. This is why, as I am, I would say, uh, sometimes responsible of thesis and PhD, I don't put, and I refuse to put any PhD on some, on some thing which is not launched. You can prepare, but no PhD on something which is, if you don't have the, the samples or the data at home, no way. It's not because I'm a bad guy, it's because I have some experience <laughs> for the other. So, uh, in space you have a lot of single point of failure, and you are not responsible of all these point of failure. Don't add more on ground. So take care on the ground, and I will take some example. Mistakes, Phobos, two missions from the Russians, two times. No, one time, they sent the board order. Shut down. The spacecraft shut down. Oh. And so, too bad. It happens. Not only in Russia, believe me. <laughs> Not only in Russia. Huygens. Huygens, this was a probe which was made by uh, ISA to land on Titan. On Titan, and it's done, and so, but there was a lot of mistakes. Not so difficult, but anyway, sometimes difficult. Engineers forgot to switch on the second radio channel. So instead of half, half twice the data, you just have a, one part of the data. And then, after it's easy to, to, to laugh about that, but it's not so easy when you are in, in the loop itself. They didn't take into account the Doppler effect between Huygens and Cassini. So that means that the, the width of the, ba uh, uh, the bandwidth was not sufficient and they have to adapt and to change things in flight and the software to be sure that they are able to transmit the data from Huygens, which was on the ground, and Cassini, which was flying over. So, and then you have a Doppler effect. So, an example, bad management of return samples. So this was my last experiment on uh, the International Space Station. I was not in the loop for that. I convinced my management that I have, and we were working on, we say, on uh, biological samples that we send on the space station. We recover them, them in uh, Russia and we bring them in Europe and in France. I convinced my management that I would bring myself, with some people, uh, the samples, I will wait in Russia for it was lasting for 10 days. I will take the samples as soon as possible. I will take care of the samples. I will bring them back in France to distribute them to the scientists. So I did. There were some problems. They forgot to, to warn the, the customs when I came back. They don't want to, leave me to, to, to let me go out of Russia with the samples. So I have to discuss for uh, three hours about that <laughs> in Russia, in Russian with people uh, asking and calling all the people that I can know in Russia. And it was, uh, it was uh, the 3rd of May. And in Russia, from the 1st of May to the 8th of May, is the same as from the 25th of December 
25th of December and the 1st of January <laughs> in France, in Europe. That means that everything is closed, it's big vacations and so on, so on, so on. And so I have to find a way to call the good general, the good general to have the permission to leave. I was that. There was a guy from ISA with, I was in the same kind of samples. So he was able to left Moscow and he arrived in uh, Amsterdam to store everything at ISA. But in Amsterdam, and when we come back, you have, I would say, perhaps 100 grams of, 100 grams of samples, but you have, I would you say, uh, 100 kilograms of boxes. Okay. So, the same day, in Amsterdam, this was the, the days of the Queen. At Isa, Isa was shut down. Okay, we had a special authorization to enter. But, the day of the Queen, the lift is closed. That means that it was the, the sample uh, place was on the fourth floor of the, of the Erasmus building and he has to, uh, to go with his 100 kilograms from the ground floor up to the, third, the fourth floor. He was alone, obviously. Nobody cares about this poor guy coming back from Russia after having, uh, I would say, stay for almost uh, one month there. So he came back with everything. <coughs> he go and he arrived, there was a freezer and a refrigerator. Where do we have to put the samples? Amstram Gram, na 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 Freezer. They are lost. Has to be done in the freezer. So, I met the, the manager. He said, oh, this stupid guy. No, no. I told him, you are the responsible. You are the manager. You have to think that the poor guy coming back alone he has to, 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 to meet some people, he has to be uh, to have help. And uh, with something which is precious because he's coming to space, from space, you have to be two or three people to help him. When I came back from, first I was in Moscow with a US guy, we were two, checking each other. When I came back in France, I would say uh, uh, the, the 3rd of May, which is not the best, it was a uh, bank holidays and things like that, the people were waiting for me at the airport and there was a scientist were there and so and so. I was not never alone. This guy was alone. <laughs> so management is very important. And there is no small things. When you are in space and where, when you are dealing with a flight hardware or flight results or flight samples, they are very, very precious and nothing you, be very, very serious. So uh, inaccurate transmission, ground to space, and flight errors. So in flight errors, that's the communication with the, with, uh, the astronaut is not uh, simple, but so I will go a little bit. So sometimes, yeah, I will say good results. And this is interesting because you see this was in uh, July uh, 20, uh, 2018, and this is a radar evidence linked with, um, uh, with the Charade on uh, Mars Express which was launched in 2003 and which is still working. So you have some papers anyway and you can have results. It's very, very important and you see it lasting a long time. So the phase F, so phase E could be the worst and could be the best. <laughs> phase F, how to stop a mission when it's working. That's a real problem. So, sometimes you can make a scientific decision. For instance, Galileo was a US mission around Jupiter, gave a lot of data about Jupiter system, about Europa also, and they decided to have, the, by the end of the, day, uh, of, the, of the mission, to make Galileo diving in the atmosphere of Jupiter to be sure that it will never eat uh, it will never eat uh, Europa, contaminating this surface. So this is a decision, and you make it. And it was the same, I would say, for, uh, for instance, uh, for um, uh, Cassini. 
to dive inside, I would say, uh, the atmosphere of Saturn. And it was on the grand final. It was the same also uh, for Rosetta. Instead of having uh, this spinning, I would say, uh, spacecraft, which was not able to stay around the, the, uh, around the comet, ESA decided to have it, I would say, eating and uh, landing between quotes and to the comet. So, sometimes you have to make decisions. The Mir space station, for instance, was working well, but they don't have the money to, to make it and to have at the same time the International Space Station and the Mir space station. So they decided to stop it and to have uh, this, um, these things uh, coming back, this uh, station coming uh, down in the atmosphere. Sometimes there are some constraints. So Planck, when they are running out of helium, is no longer cool, cold, and you have to stop the mission. You have to remember that with Planck, you had the coldest point of the universe. 50 millikelvin. You cannot <laughs> achieve that. <laughs> it's the coldest point of the, uh, of the universe. So, malfunctions and failures, Phobos Grund, so Phobos Grund, uh, it was a Russian, uh, a Russian uh, um, spacecraft and uh, was supposed to uh, go to Phobos and to retrieve some samples from Phobos and uh, so there was a, a failure at the launch and uh, the Phobos Grund uh, stay uh, in orbit of the Earth for uh, 10 days and fall down in the ocean. The other, Schiaparelli. Schiaparelli is, was supposed uh, to demonstrate the ability of Europe to land on Mars. It was uh, the Earth, uh, the uh, entry, descent and landing demonstrator. And uh, so it was not working. And so we did 80% uh, of the work, but the end, it was finished. And for instance, Envisat, so this is Envisat, is the biggest satellite which was uh, produced and launched by uh, Europe, was working for two years, and one day, he stopped. No signal, no way, nothing, nobody knows what is it. The problem is, uh, this is kind of, uh, of bus, huh? you know, it's, uh, and uh, the problem is that he is uh, orbiting the Earth, and if it is heated by if it's uh, hit by any debris, it could explode. It could explode and make, I would say, millions of debris. And there is uh, a lot of discussion now. What we will do with Envisat? Can we try to make it to to send a satellite to take it and to make it uh, diving in the atmosphere quickly? The problem is that uh, it's active. You don't know what is active inside. There is a, the propellant is inside also. So that uh, even you are sending something close, you are trying to do something, you are not sure that you will not, uh, I would say, initiate a catastrophe. <laughs> so it's something which is under discussion. And the cost is around 100 million euros, minimum. And nothing is planned to grab it. You, you cannot grab it, I would say, your satellite. <laughs> there is no way. <laughs> you see, it's a very, it's a big problem. So, phase F is sometimes difficult. So, this is uh, the phase F and the end of Rosetta. You see uh, the last image. And uh, this is uh, the beginning, uh, the signal. And it was the end. And I can tell you that people were, there was a lot of emotion, a lot of emotion because remember that Rosetta, the first paper describing the mission was written by French scientists with uh, European scientists also, but uh, the, the, the head was really at uh, EIS in 1983. The mission was selected in, uh, by ESA in 1993. It was launched in 2004. It arrived around the comet of sharasimenko It changed comet huh, because the comet destroyed, <laughs> disappeared, they missed the launch opportunity and things like that. It's a long story. I have a presentation for that. It's another story. But, uh, so, 
And uh, so it, it arrived around the comet in 2014. So, so you see, 83, 14, 31 years. So, and finally, we have, uh, I would say, gorgeous results. I'm sure that you heard about the, the results, but so. And it was a long story, and so uh, you are falling in love with, uh, with your, uh, your mission, obviously. So, these are, I would say, the main things that I wanted to present to you on the facts, which are, I would say, real things that can happen in, uh, in, uh, in space. But from there, there are some lessons for life. So, my personal says, something which is not working on the ground will not work in space. It seems obvious, believe me, it's not so obvious. If some study tells, oh no, no, it will work better in space, no. If it's not working on ground, it will never work on space. Never. So model and test policy, as for the qualification model to test and calibrate. So you need to have, I would say, your models and you have to be sure that to achieve your science, you have to calibrate your instruments. It seems obvious in the development of a project, the first thing which is disappearing is the calibration. <laughs> So, you have, if you are a scientist, you have to be strong about that. Very strong about that. That's mainly for the astronauts. Test the real flight hardware and not the mock-ups. Because uh, when you are dealing, uh, I work on the, on the space station and on the instrument for the astronaut, there is always a difference between the mock-up and the, the real hardware. And the locker is not at the same place. The organization is not the same. And so, for the astronauts, always ask to work on the real hardware, not on mockups. Design robust experiments and have redundant systems. Because if uh, you have a single point of failure, which is, um, I would say, uh, which probably happened, you will show that it will happen. <laughs> so, you must be robust. And it's very important. The so ground segment is as important as the flight segment. Also in the space station, in the space business, in the space agencies, very often the ground segment people are not taking care of. Just an example, it's not exactly the case, but for instance, we are working with, on SVOM, with, uh, which is uh, to study the, the, the gamma outburst uh, with uh, the Chinese. So we are working hard on the satellite and that. But we need around uh, 20 observatories uh, on the ground. Nobody cares up to uh, five years ago <laughs> or six years ago. And now <laughs> we are trying to find and to design and to find this, uh, this ground uh, telescopes, uh, 60, uh, one meter or something like that. And so, so the ground segment is very important. And because everything is now I would say international, be prepared for the cultural differences. Not on the national culture, it's very important. French German, French Italian, French Chinese, German Chinese, German Italians, German Russians, and it's, it's always you have to take care of these cultural differences. It's not, it's not better or not. People, when they are saying the same words, they are not listening the same thing <laughs> and be prepared for that and uh, frankly speaking, speaking I have the chance to have uh, to work uh, to have worked with uh, Chinese, Japanese, Russians, uh, people from uh, South African America and South Africa and things like that and all over Europe and any times so you have to very to be careful about the understanding of each other. It's a personal effort and then Scientists, engineers, contractors, and agency officers who are not always speaking the same language. About money, about schedule, and things like that. So that's very, very important. So take care of that and be conscious that it's not so easy. So, and just I'm trying to summarize who wants what. Scientist, as good as possible. Engineer, as complicated as conceivable. The contractor, as bad as acceptable. Don't do too much. The budget chauffeur, cheaper is better. 
So, and the role of a person like me at CNES is to make that everything is able to work smoothly and to deliver first an instrument and then results. That my goal is not to make that, but to make that happening. <laughs> so, there is a US principle is, which is uh, often used when people are going in a, a lot of ideas and they keep it simple, stupid. But you know, you are in France, so I have the French kiss. <laughs> keep it simple, stupid, but sounding. It must have a sense. Okay, so this is my almost last sentence. You want to have that in photo? <laughs> the kiss principle <laughs> and the French kiss right after? <laughs> okay, <laughs> they will be there anyway. <laughs> you ask, ask me for a French kiss. <laughs> I will give you that. <laughs> so. And today, we have a special day. What? This is a Women's Day. You notice that? 8th of May, 8th of April, of, of March. I will write. 8th of March is a Women's Day. In October, we will have the Science Week. And this is a question that I ask for the students that I will meet next year, no, next week. Not, not about the Women's Day, because of it today. How do you define a woman? But <laughs> how do you define science? <laughs> so the question is, in October we will have a science week, but how do you define science? And this is a discussion that you can have during the lunch. <laughs> Thank you very much.